Coming soon, to Hastings Mystery Theater. Shake Hands with Murder, it's a 1944 mystery comedy. Bail Bond partners Iris Adrian, Frank Jenks must solve a murder to get their money back. Hastings Mystery Theater is coming to you from Hastings, Michigan, USA. We originally created this series for local access TV, around 2010, and in 2019 started uploading to YouTube to share these classic films from the 1930s and 40s with their worldwide audience. And don't forget to check out our mystery theme merchandise which you can find in the description below. Please consider leaving us your thoughts in the comment section, as well as giving this video a like, and subscribing to our channel. Also, check out the link in the description below. Click the link to enjoy a free bonus Hastings Mystery Theater episode. Thanks again for your kind support that enables us to continue bringing you these great old classic black and white movies. Good evening. Welcome to Hastings Mystery Theater. I'm your host and mystery master, Randall Schaefer. Tonight we have another wonderful black and white murder mystery from the 1930s and 1940s. Tonight the corridors of mystery take us to 1935 for a Liberty's picture production the Spanish Cape Mystery. This was the very first movie featuring the famous literary detective Ellery Queen. In the 1940s, Columbia made a series of seven Ellery Queen movies, which were very low budget movies. This first one from Liberty Pictures was on even a lower than a lower budget, but it still shows a pretty good story will overcome a low budget every time. The character of Ellery Queen was created by two cousins from Brooklyn who used the pseudonyms of Frederick Denay and Manfred Lee to write books about a mystery writer named Ellery Queen who helps the police solve particularly puzzling murders. To add authenticity, they also used the name of Ellery Queen as the author of these same Ellery Queen books. They collaborated on a long series of Ellery Queen novels and short stories over a period of 42 years. During the 1930s and 40s, Ellery Queen was best known American literary detective, as well known as was Agatha Christie and Hercule Perrault in the United Kingdom. Donald Cook stars in tonight's movie. He was born in Portland in 1901 and worked on a farm and for a lumber company. And while a student at the University of Oregon, he decided he wanted to be an actor. His story is typical, small parts in unforgettable movies, and then steady work until, in his case, 1950. And after that, he worked on stage until dying from a heart attack in 1961 at age 60. In tonight's movie, Ellery Queen goes on vacation in a rented cabin and is soon swept up in kidnapping and murder of a neighbor. The police suspect one family member after another until those suspects are also murdered. Ellery Queen is attracted to a young woman in the family. He needs an excuse to hang around there, so he decides to investigate the murders himself. Let's return to 1935 and see if Ellery Queen gets the girl and can he solve the murder of the Spanish Cape Mystery. Inspector, I admit I've got a record, but you haven't got a thing on me. You haven't got a bit of evidence. And you know you can't hold me. He's right, Mr. Dupre. I'm afraid we'll have to let him go. But, 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 but he must have stolen Megas, Inspector. If we let him go, we'd probably never see him again. And I am out seventy-five thousand dollars. Oh, that's tough. But why make me the fall guy? Because you know what happened to my belts. Maybe the oysters came back to claim... Oh, you're a smart guy, aren't you, Gardner? Smart enough to know you've got to book me for grand larceny without evidence or let me go. You know all the answers, too, don't you? Oh, no, just enough of them to keep any dumb dick from proving I stole those rocks. Maybe I can introduce you to someone that can prove it. Get my son, Ellery. If he's not at the club, try his apartment. Now listen, Ellery. 
You and I have been planning this trip together for some time, so don't let your father talk you out. <laughs> don't worry, Judge. He's probably up to his neck in murders, as usual. Well, what are a few murders, more or less, anyway? <clears throat> Besides, I've never known but six people who didn't deserve to be murdered. Aside from you and me, who are the other four, Judge? Hmm? <clears throat> well, I can't remember. <laughs> well, maybe I exaggerated a bit. Well, with those sentiments, it's a good thing you retired from the bench. <clears throat> Hello. Oh, hello, Dad. How are you? Fine, son. Say, listen, I'd appreciate it if you'd hop down here for a minute. You know, I've got a wise guy here. I know he's guilty, but I can't pin anything on him. Oh, I'm sorry, Dad. I'd like to help you, but Judge Macklin and I are catching the noon plane for California. California? Well, what's the idea? Well, just for a vacation. Anyway, it's two hours before your plane leaves. And this crook has got me on a spot. Elroy, you've got to help me. All right, Dad, I'll see what I can do. Well, I've got to go down and say goodbye to Dad anyway. All right, but I'm going along to see that your father doesn't get you tangled up in any of his cases and make us miss that plane. Mr. Dupre, supposing you tell my son just what happened. Well, uh, late yesterday afternoon, this man, this, this gardener, he came to my store and wanted to see some pearl necklaces. I, I showed him some fine pieces, including the copy of a string said to be more my Queen Anne and worth $75,000. Then, uh, Gardner, he wanted to see a necklace in the show window. I turned to the window to get it, and as I looked back, the Queen Anne was gone. And when you questioned Mr. Gardner, he denied any knowledge of its whereabouts. Did you search him? No, but the police did. They, they searched the store, but not a sign of the missing necklace was to be found. Now, what do you know about this, Mr. Gardner? Not a thing, except if I'm not turned loose soon, I'll have a pretty good case of false arrest to give my lawyer. Well, I don't think that'll be necessary if you'll cooperate with us. Would you mind reenacting the little scene that took place in the jewelry store yesterday afternoon? Sure. What can I lose? Step over to the desk a minute, will you? Now, uh, where approximately were the necklaces on the counter? Uh, uh, here, between us. I see. Now, Mr. Dupre, uh, would you turn toward the window just as you did yesterday? All right, gentlemen, you may sit down. When the officers took Mr. Gardner out to the police car, I suppose several people congregated on the sidewalk? No, the, the, the police car drove into the alley. They, they took him out the back door. Oh, I see. Now, Mr. Dupre, what did you do last night after you left headquarters? I, I went home. Sleep well? No, no, no. I was too nervous. I, I didn't sleep at all. I, I paced it all night. I, I didn't even change my clothes. I... I suppose I do look a bit messed up, but uh, I haven't been able to think of anything else since the thing happened. Mm-hmm. Now, could I borrow a match, Mr. Gardner? Sure. Thank you. Well, it was a very entertaining case. What do you mean, it was a very entertaining case? Why, now, Dad, don't tell me you don't know where the Queen Anne necklace is. Why, of course I don't know where it is. Mr. Gardner and I know where it is. Don't we, Mr. Gardner? I don't know what you're talking about. This may be very amusing to you, young man, but I am out $75,000. Well, not yet. Mr. Dupre, let's go through the whole thing again. Just as though you were behind the counter in your store. Now, uh, would you mind getting the necklace from the showcase window again? The, the Queen Anne, but how, how did it get in my pocket? Mr. Gardner put it there, the same way that I took it out. 
If I wanted to steal a pearl necklace, why should I put it in his pocket? Because you thought you'd be taken out the front door, where your accomplice would have picked Mr. Dupre's pocket. But unfortunately for you, the police took you out the back door. <laughs> Pretty smart, Mr. Queen. But don't you think you'll have a tough time proving it? Not at all, Mr. Gardner. Pearls take fingerprints beautifully. A man of your experience ought to know that. Gardner broke down. I guess he was afraid the fingerprints on the pearls might incriminate him. Well, they wouldn't mean anything. Naturally, his fingerprints would be on the pearls. He handled them as a customer. I think that's right. You know, I never thought of that. Evidently, Gardner didn't either. A guilty conscience doesn't take much accusing. Son, this is one of the cleverest things you ever unraveled for me. Take good care of him, you old walrus. Now, now by the way, now where can I... Oh, excuse get... me, Dad, you got a match? Match, yes, sir. Well, oh, come on, Ellery. There's barely time to make that play. Right. Goodbye, Jim. Uh, goodbye, Judge. Let's see. Well, there was something I wanted to ask you fellas, but it slipped my mind. Well, so long, Dad. See you in a couple of months. Now, take good care of yourself. Right. Now, you don't smoke. What's the idea of asking people for matches? Just something original in psychology. A neat way of breaking a man's train of thought, catching him off guard. Are you kidding me again? No, not at all. You see, I suspected where the jewels were. When I asked Gardner for a match, he relaxed his vigilance for a moment and glanced towards Dupre's pocket. Uh, what was the idea of asking your father for a match? Well, he was about to ask where he could reach us in California. Oh, well, I'm glad you didn't tell him. If he knew our address at Spanish Cape, he'd have you on the phone every day. <laughs> You're right. And by the way, I hope you haven't oversold me on this place. How are the neighbors? There aren't any. Oh, except the Godfreys. And they're so rich and snooty that half the time they don't talk to each other. Well, fine, then we don't have to talk to them. Well, I'll say we won't. Their mansion at Spanish Cape is one of the show places of the coast. But they've got a pack of dogs to keep folks out. Nice people. Uh -huh. <clears throat> Why didn't you finesse that king of spades, you idiot? Well, I suppose I should have. I'm the poor dear can play it all the way you stare at her, George. Well, that makes another rubber for us. I could do better playing without a partner. Check. Check, check, check. I know when I'm check. Well, chess still has its amenities, even though they're lacking in Spanish cake. Huh. If I were engaged to you, I could think of much more romantic things on a moonlight night than chess. Well, Leslie and I have an understanding. Well, let's hope it leads to a misunderstanding. You stupid dumbbell. I made a demand bid. Why didn't you take me out? Well, I had nothing to take you out with, George. Oh, you're just a... Uh, George, won't you please? Now, you keep out of this and stop interfering in my affairs. I guess I know how to handle my own wife. You people think just because you have money, you can manage everybody. Listen, man, I'm just about fed up on you and your hours. Well, I'm fed up on being treated like a poor relation. You could be treated at the gate if I had my way. Walter! I meant what I said. I've had enough of these fortune hunters, and they can't get out soon enough to please me. Are you insinuating by any chance that if I'm... If the shoe fits you, you can wear it. Your father's calling me names again. That's 1180 they owe us. Oh, we couldn't possibly take the money, Laura. Why not? Squabbles and sentiment have no place in bridge. There's something wrong. Well, what do you mean? I think my... Queen was there. In fact, I know it was there. Are you insinuating that I moved your queen? No, I'm not insinuating it. I'm saying it. I suppose one shouldn't expect anything else from such a mannerless boar. Listen, whippersnapper. Another crack out of you and I'll spill some of that blossom blue blood of oh, yours. Oh, Dad. I've taken all I intend to from these parasites. If you and your mother don't find some way to get rid of them, I will. Oh, Leslie. Please don't mind anything Dad says. He, he's so upset. That's no excuse for incivility. At least not where I come from. Stella. Tired? <laughs> yes, I am a little, Uncle Dave. I thought we might take a little walk down to the pavilion. Something I'd like to talk to you about. Well, I guess I could stand a little fresh air. All right. Sit down, dear. Well, come on with a lecture. Lecture? <laughs> well, of course, darling, that's why you brought me down here. To beg me not to fall into the fatal infatuation of John Marco. 
to remind me that he's had three wives, that he's probably trying to hone in on my father's fortune, that he's twice my age, and I'm engaged to be married to Leslie Corn. Isn't that it? Well, yes. Yeah. But it's all true, isn't it? I've been hearing the same song from Mother and Dad for a week. Well, what can you expect, Stella? Ever since Marco came to Spanish Cape, you've been with him constantly. No. But Uncle Dave, if all girls married the men they played golf, tennis, and swam with, I'm afraid every athletic instructor would have a harem. <laughs> then it's not serious? No more than this is. You mean you're not going to marry Leslie Court either? I found it's a mistake for school sweethearts to marry when they meet again. Afraid your mother's going to be pretty well broken up. Better than a broken marriage, later on. Uh, don't you worry, you old fuck budget. You and Dad are still my only sweetheart. And when you have a real rival, I'll let you know about it. Well, you better not. I'll be jealous. <laughs> What are you doing here? This is private property. Just take it easy and you won't get hurt. Who are you and what's the idea? Never mind who I am. Now listen, Marco. But this isn't Marco. Shut up. There's no point in banging the lady into this. If it's me you want, I'll... Are you Stella Godfrey? Yes. That's all I want to know. Then you're Marco. Come on. Those dogs on the mean, it's going to be too bad for both of you. Go on, keep moving. My car's outside. Cut out the motor and the lights. Get out. With Keep your mouth shut and you won't get hurt. Go on. so fast. We didn't rent this car by the hour, you know. I see this early morning sun has done your disposition a lot of good already. Yeah, well, I've been thinking. I suppose it's foolish to imagine that you can get away from murders. Crimes are bound to follow you wherever you go. I wouldn't be surprised. I wouldn't be surprised if we're lost. Have you ever seen this place we're going to? Why, certainly. Don't you suppose I know where I'm going? I'll tell you better after we find Weaver Cottage. Whose car is that, I wonder? Hmm? Ah, oh, don't make a mystery out of it. A car can be parked beside a house without being the basis for melodrama. You're right. 
Probably just belongs to some harmless burglar. Huh? quiet place. <laughs> now listen, Judge. It's been my experience that when two men are batching it, the best way to avoid arguments is for them to share the work equally. Oh, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Why, sure, of course. Sure. All right, then. I'll unpack the luggage and cook breakfast, and you uh, go down and look at the beach. Now, 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 wait a minute. Now, I'll do my share. What's that? Mice. Well, they must be pretty big mice. Well, why not? Everything's on a bigger scale in California. It's a girl, and she's gagged. All my experience as a detective has prepared me for this moment. My intuition told me that I should find her here. Observation assures me that she is beautiful, and deduction proves that she is... You must be crazy. He is. Who are you? I'm Stella Godfrey from Spanish Cape. Who are you? What are you doing in the Weaver house? We rented it. This is Judge Macklin of New York. My name is Ellery Queen. Ellery Queen, the detective? Why, I read about you. You're just the man I need. That makes it mutual. Now all we need is a justice of the peace. How about you, Judge? Ellery, will you be quiet? Let the young lady tell us what happened. Well, you see, last night... We'll drive you home, Miss Godfrey. Your folks are probably worried about you. You think they've killed my uncle? Oh, I don't think so. When they find out they have the wrong man, they'll probably let him go. I wouldn't worry about it. I hope so. Be careful, Ellery. Don't get mixed up in this. You mean with the girl? No, 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 the murder. You know her uncle's probably shark food right now. Well, maybe, but don't let the poor kid know about it until she has to. No. The Lotharis Odorata seems to be doing quite well. Don't you think so, Jerome? Yes, they do, Mr. Godfrey. In fact, a great deal more so than the Bellis Perennis. Hmm. <laughs> oh, wait a minute, Mr. Queen. What's the matter? I'll have to go with you while you open the gate. Our police dogs are tearing them to pieces unless they're with one of the family. Watchdogs. Dad's yeah, a sickler for privacy. With these dogs patrolling the grounds and the ocean and the rocks in front, those rangers can get in. That's why I can't understand how that kidnapper got in last night. Uh, I, I think we'll take up the Bellis Perennis and uh, put in some uh, viola tree color, huh? huh? Just huh? as you say, sir. About it. I'm replacing the Bella Spurinus with the viola tree color. I mean about the kidnapping of Uncle Dave. Kidnapping of who? You mean to say you don't know anything about it? Well, I thought you and Uncle Dave were still asleep. It's only about 8 o'clock. Uncle Dave and I were held up on the terrace last night by a man. He tied me up in the Weaver cottage and took Uncle Dave away in Weaver's boat. What? 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 Joram! Hold it the sheriff and tell him to come over here right away. Yes, Mr. Godfrey. Oh, Dad, this is Mr. Queen and Judge Macklin. They found me at the cottage. How do you do? His mother! It's a murder. Would you hear a dollar to a donut? It's a murder. Darling, Don Monaco has been murdered. Look. Huh. Serves him right. I went down for my swim. I found him in the pavilion. Why, I... I thought at first he was asleep. I said, this is horrible. Oh, let's take a look. Stay with your mother, Stella. I told your friends what follow you. I'll keep out of this.
looks as if he's been dead for some time. Dear Luke, it's an odd time to be writing a letter. 12.30 a.m. Things look rosy and it's only a matter of days until I shall be able to make a clean sweep. They are falling for the plan, hook, line, and sink it. I knew he was up to something crooked ever since he came here. Who was he? John Marco, a distant relative of Mrs. Godfrey's. That's a funny-looking get-up to be writing a letter in at one o'clock in the morning. Very interesting. I'm afraid these are deep waters. Yes, but you're going to keep out of them. This is none of our business. I'm sorry, but you can't leave. Those are the sheriff's orders. But we've been here for almost an hour. How long do you expect to keep us? Until the coroner and Sheriff Moley have completed their examination of the body. He'll be back in a few minutes. Better possess your soul in patience, Judge. Mm, a fine vacation. I knew if we went any place, they'd put on a crime wave for your benefit. <laughs> Mind the company? No, sit down, Mr. Queen. Mr. Queen, why don't you introduce yourself to the sheriff and help him? You could do more to solve this case than these country bumpkins. I'm sorry, but I have forsworn murder, mayhem, and mystery in all their aspects during my vacation. Besides, the California police are very confident they might resent my intrusion. Well, do you think there's any connection between the kidnapping of my uncle and the murder of Mr. Marco? Uh, who is that good-looking fellow over there? My uh, fiance, Mr. Court. Would you mind if I murdered him? What? Well, that's the most efficient method of getting rid of a rival. Mr. Queen, can't you take anything seriously? I was never more serious in my life. I am trying to decide whether to put a black widow spider in his pajamas or cyanide lumps in his mashed potatoes. They can't get away with murder in Sheriff Moniz County. I'll show them that none of their perfect crimes go here. What's your name? Tell her, sir. I'm the butler. Hunt, take this guy upstairs. Make a search of Marco's rooms. Yes, sir. Good one. Take a couple of the boys and comb the house and grounds for a heavy object with blood stains on it. Okay, Sheriff. Uh, Mr. Godfrey. Uh, sh uh, Sheriff, please. Uh, what have you heard about my brother? David Kummer? Uh, yes. Uh, I phoned the Coast Guard. They're looking for the weaver boat now. Mr. Godfrey, who are all these people? Oh, they're our guests. They're fortune hunters. Uh, Walter? I mean just what I said. These people, the Munns, Mrs. Constable Marco, they came here to plot to see how they could do a deserving woman out of an estate. Just a minute. Shut up! What deserving woman? My great aunt Sophia's companion. You see, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Munn, Mrs. Constable, Mr. Marco and I were all the heirs. My aunt was worth millions, but when she died, she left all the money to her companion. So, uh, Mr. Marco asked me to invite all the heirs here to see if we couldn't figure out some way of breaking the will. A will? <laughs> Dear me, next we'll find there's a mortgage on the old homestead. Shut up there! I beg your pardon? I said shut up! Don't you understand? Oh, I think I get your subtle implication. Fresh guy. I'll attend to you later. What other heirs are there to the estate? None. Oh, except my brother. Hmm. Who are you? One of the fortune hunters, too? I beg your pardon. That's Mr. Court. Uh, you see, he's engaged to my daughter. A little arrangement cooked up by my wife and his mother to unite the aristocratic court name with the Godfrey money. I've had enough of your insinuations. I'm leaving immediately. No one's leaving till I say the word. <clears throat> I am Judge Macklin of the New York Supreme Court. Uh, my friend and I got mixed up in this only because we rented the Weaver Cottage and found Miss Godfrey tied up there. Now, I demand that you let us leave immediately. Oh, 
What's your name, wise guy? Queen. Queen? Yes, you know, what a king marries. He's Ellery Queen, the famous New York detective. He could solve this for us if he only would. Are you the guy they wrote all those books about? Yes, but don't believe everything you read in print. <laughs> Not by a long shot. I've read all that stuff about you. In fact, I've read every detective story ever written. And I've always wanted to run up against one of you modern, theorizing Sherlock Vances. Well, you're out of luck, Sheriff. I'm on a vacation, and besides, I've given up detecting. Finally found a case that stumps you, eh? That's it. And now, if you don't mind, the judge and I will hire us to our bachelor quarters. Well, sit down a minute, Mr. Queen. I'll show you how a real detective solves a case. John Marco was killed by a wire around his neck that strangled him. He had previously been rendered unconscious by a blow over the head with some heavy object. The coroner said there would probably be bloodstains on it. With the exception of uh, Mr. Queen and Judge Macklin, everyone in this room had a motive for the murder. I, I, I didn't. Neither did I. Your fiancé would be an indirect heir to the estate. You could probably do with an extra million or two, just like the rest of us. Same thing applies to you, Mr. Godfrey. Oh, nonsense. What was the idea of your taking a swim so early in the morning, Mrs. Godfrey? Well, I... I often take a swim early in the morning. How long were you down at the pavilion? Only a couple of minutes, uh, until I discovered Mr. Marco was dead. Any witness to that? Well, uh, no, you see, I, I... I always go out the back door. In investigating a murder, we always look for motive, opportunity, and mean. As an heir to the estate, you had the same motive as the others, Mrs. Godfrey. In addition, there is considerable gossip around Spanish Cape as to Mr. Marco's attentions to your daughter. You resented them, didn't you? Yes, but I... That's motive number two. But I had the same motive. Yes, but you didn't have the opportunity. Mrs. Godfrey did. As to the means of murder, there's plenty of wire around the place. And my men will find the heavy object with the bloodstains on it. But how will that incriminate Mrs. Godfrey? According to the note found in the pavilion, Marco was killed at one o'clock this morning. Probably a forgery. Left there by your wife to create an alibi. Uh, of course, I wouldn't know about such things. But surely the coroner could tell by the condition of the body how long Marco had been dead. Very bright, Mr. Sherlock. But Mr. Marco had a touch of diabetes. And the coroner informs me that with a man in his condition, rigor mortis would set in almost immediately after death. Under the circumstances, Mrs. Godfrey, I have no alternative but to arrest you for the murder of John Marco. Oh, this is ridiculous. Mother, don't let him fry. Oh, you're crazy. Say, Sheriff. Well, I've gone through Marco's things and can't find any clue except that his bed wasn't slept in last night. It wasn't? No. And the clothes Marco wore last night are missing. What did you expect a dead man to do? Walk upstairs and hang his clothes in the closet? No, sir. But we've searched the house and grounds. They've disappeared completely. We'll find them all right. Sorry, Sheriff. We can't find any heavy object with blood stains on it. All right. You two go outside and don't let anybody in. I'll talk to you later. Yes, sir. You may as well come clean, madam. What did you hit Marco over the head with? And what did you do with his clothes? I tell you, I don't know anything about it. Mr. Queen, I know my mother isn't guilty. Won't you please help us find the murderer? I wouldn't think of intruding my meager talents. Sheriff Moley has the case so well in hand. You mean you think my mother's guilty? Well, of course. 
You see, Miss Godfrey, your mother woke up this morning feeling sure that Mr. Marco would be in the beach pavilion. So she went to the bathhouse and armed herself with a pair of bathing trunks. She surprised Mr. Marco writing a letter, which through some oversight he had dated seven hours previously. She crept up stealthily behind him, and since no bloodstained object has been found, it is obvious that she doubled up her massive fist, hit him over the head, and knocked him as cold as an embalmed herring. Then she strangled him with a wire, removed his clothes, and put on the bathing trunks. But she realized, however, that the clothes would be evidence against her, so she ate them. You'll undoubtedly find that Mrs. Godfrey has a weak stomach, which accounts for her inability to get away with a cape and a hat. Well, wise guy, suppose you tell us who's guilty. I haven't the least idea, Sheriff, and I'm not interested. And now, if you don't mind, the uh, judge and I will be toddling along. Goodbye, Miss Godfrey. I don't think you have anything to worry about as far as your mother's concerned. And if you're passing our way, we'd like to have you drop in. Thank you. Goodbye, Mr. Queen. Goodbye, Judge Macklin. Goodbye, Miss Godfrey. All right. You did a pretty good bit of reasoning in this case I've just been reading. I wonder what your biographer would think of this Spanish cape mystery. Well, he's not going to have an opportunity to think anything about it. Well, I wonder who is the murderer. I thought we were taking a vacation from crime. Oh, well, of course, of course. The thing does intrigue my curiosity. Well, don't bother me. I'm asleep. So, Hillary. Suppose we take a ride over to the Godfrey's after dinner and see if there's anything to it. No. I should have to look upon the beauteous Stella. And it'd break my heart to realize that she's pledged to another. Tell me, what's the matter with you? Ever since you met that girl, you've been acting like a moonstruck calf. Of course, she's pretty enough, but... Pretty enough? Why, her eyes are like Lake Como when it challenges the splendor of the Italian sky. Her nose is of such a perfection that... Phidias would have chosen it as a model for his Grecian goddess. Uh, Henry, you've got a match? I'm a... Here I am talking about Grecian goddesses, and you ask me for a match. Do you recall her mouth? Oh, uh, yes, of course. Like I... a crimson rose on a field of stainless snow. Roses don't grow in snow. What? Oh, hello, Miss Godfrey. I, <clears throat> I was just, uh, just speaking about my mother. Oh, what a beautiful mother you must have, Mr. Queen. <laughs> yes, uh... Would you sit down? Thank you. Well, how are you this afternoon, Judge Macklin? Tolerable. What's new at Murder Mansion? Another murder. What? Ooh. Mr. Munn. I suppose I should feel more upset about these murders, but I can't. I feel the same way Dad feels about all those people. They're just after Mother for their own selfish plans. Yes, I can understand. Of course, uh, you're not interested in this new murder either. Not at all. Well, I am. Now, tell me about it. Well, go ahead. I won't listen. Well, after you left, the sheriff thought better about arresting Mother and forbade any of us to leave the estate. Then he disclosed the astounding fact that one of us was a murderer. Go ahead. I'm not listening. Well, the sheriff and the deputy spent the rest of the morning searching for a heavy object with blood stains on it and Mr. Martha's clothes. Which, of course, they did not find. I'm not talking to you. Shut up. Go on, Miss Godfrey. When luncheon was announced, Mother sent Tiller up to Mr. Munn's room. He ran down in a few minutes and said that Mr. Munn was dead. Strangled and clad only in swimming trunks. Yes. Well, how did you know? I read it in your exquisite eyes. Why didn't Ms. Munn call Mr. Munn to lunch? Well, they'd had one of their spats. They were forever fighting. Uh-oh. Wait till the sheriff hears that. Mm -hmm. By the way, where was Mrs. Munn before lunch? In the billiard room with Mr. Carr. Oh, weren't you jealous? Mrs. Munn's an attractive woman. Of course not. Our engagement was just one of those things. Please, our mothers. I broke it definitely this morning. After you met me, of course. How did you get? Mr. Queen, you have the oddest way of mixing romance and murder. It's positively ghoulish. You even reach funny papers and graveyards. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Haven't you any sense of hospitality at all? What? Oh, oh, yeah. Come in, I'm at your highball. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
Tell us another one, Judge. That last one was very funny. <laughs> well, now, this, uh, the traveling salesman said, I'll take chicken soup. I want the... Well, we have company. Excuse me. Miss Godfrey here? Oh, yes, come in. I gave positive orders that no one was to leave the estate. I'm not accustomed to taking orders. Besides, I uh, came over here to tell Mr. Queen about Mr. Munn's murder and see what he thought about it. Well, what do you think about it, Mr. Chan? Well, it's a simple case. You mean you know who the murderer is? More or less. What do you mean? Well, he's probably a man with... Uh, black spots in front of his eyes. <laughs> I've met four flushes before, but you take the cake. Come on back to your house, Miss Godfrey. I want to talk to you. All right, Sheriff. I'll go peaceful like. Judge Macklin, we'd like to have you come to dinner tonight. And uh, you might bring your unbalanced friend with you. <sighs> well, thank you, Miss Godfrey. It'll be a pleasure. Now, remember, Sheriff, if you harm one hair of yon damsel's head, young Lochinvar will come out of his vest. Oh, and incidentally, don't overlook the man with the black spots in front of his eyes. There. Why so intense, Judge? What are you thinking about? <coughs> Jackasses. <laughs> We can't give out any information. You'll have to see the sheriff at his office. But he's not in his office. He will be later. He's having dinner inside. Is Elry Queen in there too? Yeah. And you'd better not try to climb over the fence. They've got some police dogs in here that are crazy about reporter meat. I'd give one of those pooches a seat out of my pants just to find out what's going on in there. I guess there isn't anything new. This guy Queen must be slipping. The soil around here is favorable. For Veronica Scorpiotis, but I have some difficulty with my Scorpoid Sammies. Well, from what I've observed, I think you'd have better luck with Anemone Nemorosa. These Latin conversations are so exciting. Oh, you understand Latin? Oh, of course. If gay e me anigarette? <laughs> what excellent pronunciation. Yes, I uh, majored in it in kindergarten. <laughs> have you any news of my brother, Sheriff? Not so far. The Coast Guard is still looking. Uh, by the way, the weaver boat is white with green trimmings, isn't it? That's right. Tell me the truth, Sheriff. Do you think Mr. Cummer is still alive? Well, I... Uh, uh, I think there's a chance. So what's the use of beating about the bush, Molly? Cummer's probably dead and you know it. But Walter! Well, if he was alive, David would have shown up long ago. The chances are the kidnapper, when he found out he made a mistake, probably decided the wisest thing to do was to get rid of David and abandon the weaver boat. They'll probably find a beach somewhere down the coast. Uh, don't you think the man who kidnapped David might have been the murderer of John Mark? No, I don't. If it was an outsider, he could only get into the estate from the cove or through the back gate. The dogs would have taken care of anyone that came through the back gate. And as for the cove, Marco would have noticed any stranger that landed in a boat. And don't forget, it wasn't anybody from the outside, Gottman. No, sorry. The murderer is sitting right at this table. The sheriff's right. The murderer is right here among us, and he won't stop till he kills us all. I, for one, don't intend to remain here and be slaughtered. I'm leaving for Los Angeles in the morning. That goes for me, too. I want to get back to Boston. Why, Leslie, we thought you'd stay here at least until the wedding. Well, there isn't going to be any wedding. Stella and I talked it over, and you and Mother might as well know it now. That suits me down to the ground. I don't want any spineless milk Fed back bay son-in-law. Hey, listen, I've had just a... Shut up, now. all of you. I'll settle this right now. No one leaves this estate until I find the murderer. We must prepare for a nice old age at Spanish Cape. Well, Philo, I don't see you setting the world on fire as a detective. Suppose you tell us who the murderer is. 
I told you. What do you mean, you told me? I told you to look for a man with black spots in front of his eyes. Fine. Suppose you stay and help us find him. You can take care of Mr. Queen and the judge, can't you, Mrs. Godfrey? Of course, I, I'd be glad to. This is preposterous. Oh, I'm not so sure about that. These murders didn't start until the arrival of yourself or Mr. Queen. I think you'll bear a little watching. I really think it's a good idea, Judge. I've seen murder in your eye more than once. I hope you have no objection if I retire to my room. I don't care what you do, as long as you don't leave the estate. I'm going to take a look at my flower beds. Uh, well, why don't you get up a bridge game, huh? All right, Walter. We'll probably take our minds off this dreadful business. And we'll have a lovely little house with ivy climbing down the walls and through the windows and up the stairs. You don't have ivy inside houses. Well, I know, but ours is going to be different. Oh, I can see that. And every night when I come home from work after solving six or seven murders, you'll meet me at the gate. And then we'll go in and sit down to a gorgeous dinner of... A burnt steak and scorched vegetables. Well, you can't cook? Well, that's all right. Neither can I. And then you know what we'll do? Backbite our neighbors. Sure. Come on in, Claire. We'll get at the bottom of this right now. Mrs. Munn, were you and your husband on good terms? Why, why, yes. I've heard different. Just repeat what you told me in the pantry. Well, of course, I don't like to interfere in other people's affairs, but I heard Mr. and Mrs. Munn arguing constantly since they arrived here. In fact, he threatened to strike her several times. Isn't it true that you and your husband were fighting all the time? Why, I... <laughs> For every woman who fought with her husband killed him, America would be populated solely by Amazons. You keep out of this. I am handling it. Mishandling it, you mean. You can't cry yourself out of this, lady. You were the heir to your husband's share of the estate. In addition, you probably hated him. You saw the chance to kill him, and make it seem as though the murder of Marco got him. I didn't do it. I didn't. Of course she didn't. This is ridiculous. Where were you just before lunch when your husband was killed? Why, I was in the billiard room with Mr. Court. We'll find out about that. Mr. Court said he was going to his room. Ask him to come down. Yes, sir. Well, where's Court? Mr. Court is dead, sir. What? Strangled, sir, and in bathing trunks, just like Mr. Munn and Mr. Marco. Oh, this is terrible. Can we do something to... Nobody moves till I get back here. Go outside, get Deputy Saunders. Tell him to stand guard on that door. Then round up the other servants and bring them in here. Yes, sir. Who are you? I'm Mrs. Sheehan, the cook. And I know all about these killings. Oh, you do? Sure, and I do. The house is bewitched. It's the work of a banshee. Huh. Another amateur detective, eh? You and Mr. Queen ought to get together. Who are you? I'm Pip, the housemaid. What have you been crying about? I'm I'm afraid we're we're all going to be killed. Huh. It's beginning to look like it. Where were you after dinner? I was reading the newspaper in the kitchen. Is that right? Yes, sir. And Pitt's poor dear, she was there too. What were you doing from the time you left the dining room till you met me in the pantry? I was packing Mr. Marco's things. Mrs. Godfrey asked me to. Did you see or hear anything upstairs? No, sir. All right. You can go back to your work. 
Well, that lets the servants out. Now, all the rest of you have been in this room since right after dinner, with the exception of one man. He was absent for about 15 minutes, with the excuse that he was looking after his flowers. During that 15 minutes, he probably sneaked in the side door and killed Court. Everyone here heard him say he hated him, and was glad his daughter wasn't going to marry him. Mr. Godfrey, it's my duty to arrest you for the murder of Leslie Court. Huh? And I must inform you that anything you say now may be used against you. Ah, oh, blah. Sure, Molly, you must be crazy why Dad wouldn't hurt a fly. At first, it was Mrs. Godfrey. Then it was Mrs. Munt. Now it's Mr. Godfrey. Why don't you just play eeny, meeny, miny, mo and find out who's in it? Say. I've had just about enough of your wisecracks. And I have, too. I beg your pardon? You've done nothing but make fun of Sheriff Molly ever since you came here. At least he's trying hard and doing his best to find the murderer. You came here with the reputation of a great detective. Now, I don't want to be offensive, but what you've shown so far, you're either a four-flusher, as Sheriff Molly says, or you're too selfish to help people in trouble. Miss Godfrey is right, Ellery. I've always disparaged your interest in criminology. But in this case, I think you ought to help these good people to the best of your ability. Miss Godfrey, I have deliberately avoided doing anything in this case for only one reason. Probably because you couldn't solve it. No, because of you. Because of me? I'm afraid that finding the murderer would only bring you sorrow. The culprit is obviously someone who is near and dear to you. It may be your mother, it may be your father. I don't believe it. But if that is a possibility, why did you make fun of Sheriff Molly when he suspected them? Well, I wasn't criticizing his suspicions, only his methods. His methods of arresting people on evidence that couldn't even secure an indictment. If the murderer isn't your mother or father, it may be one of your relatives, Mrs. Constable, or, or Mrs. Munn. Obviously, an abused woman who would think she had plenty of motive for killing her husband. Looking at the thing analytically and objectively, even you are a suspect. Me? Oh, I've known she was a suspect all along. But suppose she was guilty. Wouldn't it be your duty as a decent citizen to uncover her guilt? Our conception of duty is dictated by our reason, Sheriff. And a young man in love is never reasonable. A big pardon, Sheriff. I found this in one of Mr. Marco's suits, sir. Dear John, please meet me at the pavilion near the beach after midnight. I must talk to you. Signed, Stella. Is this your handwriting? Yes. So you had an appointment with Marco right around the time he was killed. Why didn't you tell us? The appointment wasn't for last night. It was for a week ago. I'll think this over for the time being. But if you know anything about these murders, you'd better come clean. I don't know anything I haven't told you. Of course she doesn't. You're fired. I won't have servants snooping around incriminating my family. I only do my duty as I see it, sir. He can't go till the investigation is over. Say, when you come to think of it, Tiller had an opportunity to kill Court while he was upstairs packing Marco's things. That's right. How can you prove that you didn't kill Cort? More easily than you can prove that I did, sir. I give up. This case is a regular crossword puzzle. Everybody acts suspicious, and you can't prove a thing on anyone. We'd better call it a night.
This is Constable. She fell off the cliff. What do you mean, she fell off? What were you doing here? Oh, I... I found a note in my room telling me to be here at 12.30 or my uncle would be killed. Just as I came through the bushes, I saw Mrs. Constable fall or jump over. Probably suicide. Maybe. Why didn't you tell us about that note? Whoever wrote the note told me not to. Well, you can see for yourself the note's in my room. Take Miss Comfrey back to the house. I'm going down and take a look at Mrs. Constable. Write this letter, Miss Godfrey. Well, of course I didn't. It's your handwriting, isn't it? Well, it, it looks like it, but I didn't write it. I'm sorry. It looks to me as though you deliberately enticed Mrs. Constable to the cliff and pushed her over. But I told you. I found a note. Wait a minute. But this is printed. Anyone could have done it. The fact that you didn't bring it to me is damning evidence against you. But don't you understand? I was afraid they'd kill my uncle. You should have let me be the judge of that. Under the circumstances, considering the fact that a note was found in Marco's clothes, written by you, and that Mrs. Constable was killed with a note in her hand asking for a rendezvous with you, I'm sure the grand jury would return an indictment against you for murder. I therefore consider it my duty to arrest you for the murders of Lorna Constable and John Marco. And I think even you will admit that her guilt is obvious. Too obvious. What do you mean? Well, if Miss Godfrey wanted to kill Mrs. Constable, she could have asked her to meet her on the cliff. She wouldn't need to write a note, which she knew was bound to be evidence against her. As for this note here, as you say, anyone could have written it. Anyone except Miss Godfrey. Hmm. Again, the stratagem is too obvious. A lot of theories. We can't give theories to a jury. Why didn't she come to me with this note? Or even to you? Because she's a woman, Sheriff. Yeah. Get your things on, Miss Godfrey. I'm taking you to the station. Wait a minute, I'm Sheriff! I'm not waiting for anything! Oh, yes, you are. If you arrest this young woman, you'll be the laughingstock of Southern California within 24 hours. Why? Because within that time, I shall find the real murderer. Oh. I suppose you mean the man with the black spots in front of his eyes. Yes, the one with the black spots in front of his eyes. You're not a bad fellow, Sheriff. I hate to see you make a mistake. Give me until this time tomorrow morning to catch the murderer. If I fail, then arrest Miss Godfrey. 24 hours won't make any difference. All right, I'll do it. <laughs> but I don't think you've got a chance in the world. Have you got a match, Sheriff? Match? In some place. Yeah, thank you. Of course. I gotta telephone the coroner. Remember now, 24 hours till tomorrow morning at 1.30. Oh. I could have asked Molly for this, but he'd be afraid I'd destroy Exhibit A in the case of the People versus Stella Godfrey. You think you know who's guilty, Hillary? I haven't the slightest idea, but I know who isn't. Hello, Ned. Well, you can come out and pick up another one. It's getting so that the corpses around here are in the majority. Yeah. If this keeps up, we won't have a quorum for the inquest.
Does it tell you anything? Only that the note was printed by a man, as I expected. Well, you better dig up more than that to clear Miss Godfrey. She could have had a man to print that note. And considering the other evidence against her, well, I've seen juries convict people on a lot less. Well, uh, supposing we admit there is evidence against Miss Godfrey, what about the others? <clears throat> well, I don't know. Of course, when Marco was killed, I felt sure I'd pegged the murderer. Whom did you suspect? Mom. Mm -hmm. Who shattered your theory by getting himself killed. And did you have any theory? Well, to tell you the truth, I suspected Court. You seemed a little too anxious to get away last night. <laughs> you better be careful, Judge. All your suspects have come to a bad end. <laughs> well, so it seems, yes, I... What happened at the inquest? Oh, the usual verdict. Murder by person or persons unknown. You didn't say anything about Miss Godfrey? Oh. The inquest on Mrs. Constable isn't until tomorrow. What do you think our morgue is? An auditorium? Say, what's the idea? That's Exhibit A in the case of... Of the people versus Stella Godfrey. However, I found out that it was written by John Doe. Ah. Did you find out anything about John Doe? Well, I have a theory. It would explain everything if I could clear up just one point. What point? Why Marco was found with an opera cape around his shoulders. <laughs> There's a lot more to be found out than that. For instance, what happened to the rest of his clothes? Well, I could explain that if I could explain the cape. Mm -hmm. And how about the heavy object the murderer used to hit him over the head? The coroner says there'd be blood on the thing, whatever it was. Well, that was a rock. The killer threw it into the ocean. Oh, why didn't I think of that? I want to check the movements on everyone the night that Marco was killed. Uh, would you all sit down, please? Will you tell Tiller to come in, please? Uh, Tiller? Yep. Oh, uh, Tiller. If you must eavesdrop, don't stand in the line with the mirror in the hallway. Hey, get Joram and the maids in here, please. Yes, sir. Come on, Sheriff, give us a break, or my city editor will be sore if as... If this dry spell keeps up, there'll be lots of dust on the ocean. We're trying to check up on just where everyone was early Tuesday morning at the time Mr. Marco was killed. Sure, and I was in my bed. But if you're wanting any witnesses to that fact, big guy, you're not going to be getting them. How about you, Joram? I, uh, I was in bed, sir. I was asleep, too. Begging your pardon, but neither Joram nor Pitts is telling the truth. How do you know? On Tuesday morning, I couldn't sleep. I sat at my window, smoking a cigarette, and saw Joram and Pitts going toward the pavilion. You mean they were together? No, at different times. How about it, Joram? I refuse to discuss it, sir. Do you realize that your reticence makes you a definite suspect? Yes, sir. Suppose you tell us the truth about your actions Tuesday morning, Miss Pitts. Oh, now, come, come. Nothing to cry about. Would you hand me that lighter on the table, please? How long were you married to Mr. Court? We weren't married. We were going to be married. Oh. I thought there was something between you two. Your crying spells didn't begin until after he was killed. I supposing you tell us everything. Well, you see, Mr. Court and I fell in love right after he came here. It, it wasn't wrong because he and Miss Stella never did intend to be married. We were planning to leave and be married as soon as he could get away. Tell us about Tuesday morning. Well, I couldn't sleep. I was worried about our elopement and and what the Godfreys would think, and and I decided to take a walk along the beach. Mr. Court had torn the lining of his opera cape and had asked me to mend it for him. Before I went for the walk on the beach, I slipped the cape about my shoulders. Well, that was Court's cape. How did he get on Marco? When, when I got down to the pavilion, I, I found Mr. Marco dead. Clothed or in bathing trunks? In bathing trunks. Why did you put the cape around his shoulders? I, I heard someone coming down the steps, and I was afraid that if they found me there with a the dead body, they'd think I killed him. I, 
I put the cape around his shoulders so that it looked from the back as if he were dressed. And I... I stood there talking to him. Who came down the steps? I don't know. Out of the corner of my eye, I could see a man's feet. Whoever it was stood there a minute and then went up. I, I waited another 10 or 15 minutes and then ran up into the house and went to my room. I've got it. I've got it. I know what the murderer did, but I don't know why. Uh, Miss Pitts, Mrs. Sheehan, and Tiller, uh, you may go. And Tiller, uh, no eavesdropping. No, sir. Joram, Miss Godfrey's freedom, maybe her life, depends upon you. I know you're trying to protect someone, but you've got to tell the truth about Tuesday morning. Well, since you put it that way, sir, it was like this. Sometime after half past twelve, I was taking a turn around the grounds to see that everything was, was all right. Then I decided to go down on the pavilion and have a smoke. So I went down there and I found Mr. Marco dead. With his clothes on? Yes, sir. Now, what did you do then? Well, I was so bored over, I must have stayed there for, uh, well, perhaps twenty minutes trying to figure out... Uh, Whether Mr. Godfrey killed Mr. Marco. You knew that the wire around the victim's neck was the same that Mr. Godfrey uses to support his plans. And you knew that Mr. Godfrey hated Mr. Marco. Yes, sir. You see, I worked a long time for Mr. Godfrey. Yes, I know. What made you go back to the pavilion the second time? Because I got to thinking that it might be something that would incriminate Mr. Godfrey. But uh, while I was thinking, I, I, I had a few fingers of scotch. And when I heard Pitts holding a conversation with the dead man, I decided I'd better call it a night. Uh, do you know anything about the tides around here, Joram? Yes, a bit, sir. Do you recall what time was high tide on Tuesday morning? Well, as near as I can remember, sir, it was somewhere around 12.35 a.m. Well, there's a high tide roughly uh, every 12 hours, isn't it? Yes, sir. Marco was killed right after high tide Tuesday morning. Munn right after high tide yesterday noon. And Mrs. Constable right after high tide last night. Interesting, eh, Molly? It would be if the victims had been drowned. Uh, Joram. How much would the tide ebb in the cold in 20 minutes? Quite a bit, sir. All right, Joram, you may go. Thank you, sir. Molly, I thought Miss Godfrey wasn't guilty. Now I know she wasn't, because I know who the murderer is. Who? Oh, I can't tell you yet. If any of you knew his identity, you might spoil my plan for catching him. Then if we don't catch him, we can't prove his guilt. Oh, by the way, Sheriff, uh, what's the telephone number of the local Coast Guard station? Oh, Spanish Cape, 1849. Thanks. Miss Godfrey, could I see you alone? Of course. Pardon us. Say, wait a minute. Yes? I'd like to know what the murderer did with Marco's clothes. Well, he wore them. He wore them? Why? Because he needed them. That guy's either crazy or he's a genius. Well, they're very similar afflictions, Sheriff. Are you a very courageous person, Miss Godfrey? Well, I... I hope so. I hope so, too. Because catching the murderer is going to depend entirely upon your courage. How? Well, when you go to bed tonight, I want you to leave your windows open, turn off the lights, and lie awake until 1.15 in the morning. Then I want you to close your eyes and pretend to go to sleep. Chances are that sometime after 1.15, the murderer will enter your room and try to kill you. But no matter what happens, you mustn't open your eyes until you hear my voice. Can I depend on you? Sure. If I can depend on you.
right, Sheriff, now! Oh, Dave! <laughs> David, come up. I arrest you for the murders of John Marco, George Munn, Leslie Court, and Lord a Constable, and the attempted murder of Stella Godfrey. And I wouldn't waste any sympathy on someone who would have killed you all. But surely, if he is insane... Uh, he was sane when he planned the murders. Months of brooding over them unsettled his mind. Well, we packed him off to the station. That guy sure is a raving maniac. And most maniacs have optical aberrations, such as black spots in front of the eyes. <laughs> you thought I was joking, but I knew these murders were the work of a madman. What I can't figure is uh, why David should want to murder any of us. To be the sole heir to your Aunt Sophia's estate. Marco came down here to trick the others out of the fortune. Cummer took a more direct method. Mm -hmm. Then he arranged the kidnapping to build up an alibi. Tuesday morning, Cummer swam ashore from the Weaver boat and killed Marco. He expected to swim right back to the boat, but Joram's appearance on the scene compelled him to hide. But why didn't he kill Joram? He only wanted to kill the heirs to the estate. While Joram stayed at the pavilion, the tide receded so far that Cummer was afraid his footprints on the wet beach would draw suspicion away from the people at the house. But he was afraid that a man walking along the street in bathing trunks at one o'clock in the morning would attract attention. That's why he changed clothes with Marco. He got back to the boat, and the next day he swam ashore again at high tide. He climbed up through the bushes and got into the house. He killed Munn and dressed him in bathing trunks to bewilder the police. Poor Court was probably killed because he came upon Cummer unexpectedly. You mean to say he was in the house all day yesterday? Suppose he had been discovered. He could say that he had just escaped from the kidnappers and swam ashore. Sometime during the night, Cummer planted the notes that would bring Stella and Mrs. Constable to the cliff. How about Mrs. Constable? Cummer hid in the bushes until Stella appeared on the scene. Then he threw a rock, hitting Mrs. Constable in the back, making her lose her balance. Oh, I see. Then after we carried her body up, he swam back to the boat. He had timed things so well that it was high tide again. You see, Cummer expected to get Stella out of the way by having her accused of the murder of Mrs. Constable. I felt sure that he'd come ashore tonight at high tide to see if Stella was gone and probably perpetrate a few more murders. Just one more thing. How did the kidnapper get by the dogs? Your uncle brought him through before he took you to the pavilion. I don't know how we ever can thank you, Mr. Queen. Well, don't thank me. Thanks, Stella. It was her courage that made the capture possible. Courage? I fainted as soon as I heard a noise at the window. In fact, I didn't come to until I heard your voice. I've got to hand it to you, Mr. Queen. You sure did your stuff. Too bad I couldn't have pulled it off. It would have made my re-election a certainty. What's going on? Oh, this reporter guy got by me. Even the dogs couldn't stop him. I said I'd get the seat out of my pants for a story. <laughs> and I did. Well, it's about time to call the reporters in. You mean you've caught the murder? Yes, but all the credit goes to Sheriff Moley. It was the most brilliant piece of deduction I have ever seen. But let the sheriff tell you about it himself. Come with me, sonny. I'll tell you how I put it over. You see, I knew from the start that it was a guy with black spots in front of his eyes. You don't mean it. Sure I do. Then I figured out about the tides, and the whole thing was in the bag. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. Gee, that's great. You're not such a clever detective. Or you'd be able to deduce what I'm thinking. You want me to? If you can. <laughs> Hi there, I'm Randall Schaefer. You see me, most of you see me, on YouTube hosting Hastings Mystery Theater. And this shirt honors Hastings Mystery Theater. If you would like a souvenir of this shirt or other similar products, take a look at the description down below. You can get yourself a souvenir. Thank you to all the YouTube people who watch us. We appreciate it. Please consider leaving us your thoughts in the comment section, as well as giving this video a like, and subscribing to our channel. Also, check out the link in the description below.
Click the link to enjoy a free bonus Hastings Mystery Theater episode. Thanks again for your kind support that enables us to continue bringing you these great old classic black and white movies.